when I was in veterinary practice, one of the things I used to say to people who came in with young um, puppies and kittens at eight weeks old for their first health checks and vaccinations with me was to say, to them, how much do you know about looking after and living with this species? Because it's the first one you've ever had. And people would say, uh, oh, no, 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 it's fine. You know, uh, my neighbours have got them and uh, all my friends have got them. It's not an issue at all. I said, OK, so here's a deal. I'm going to take your puppy away from you and I'm going to give you an eight-week-old giraffe calf. Are you confident you'd be able to take that home and look after it properly for the next 30 years? And everybody say, oh, don't be stupid. I don't know anything about giraffes. And I say, well, what makes you think you know anything about dogs? And that's the issue for me. Because animals are so familiar, pet animals, dogs, cats, rabbits, everybody thinks they know how to look after them. The RSPCA absolutely celebrates the fact that companion animals are an enormously important part of millions of people's lives. On a personal level, I can't imagine life without animals around me. At the moment, sadly, I, I don't have a dog because our old Labrador we had to put to sleep a few months ago and we're kind of going through the decision process now of, of where we go from here. But when I look back at the, the animals that I've lived with, they have been a critically important part of my family. Um, and the RSPCA as a whole, 16, 1700 people who work here, if you asked anybody in this organisation whether they thought that pets and companion animals were important in people's lives, absolutely we do. But it's a two-way street. And that as much as, you, if you like, you could call having companion animals another form of animal exploitation in the same way that eating them is exploiting them, um, uh, riding horses for leisure activities and for sport is exploiting them, so is keeping an animal as a pet. Our duty as owners and people who benefit from those relationships is to make sure that every single animal we look after has the best possible chance of having a healthy, happy life. Everybody in the RSPCA would be extremely concerned that uh, there is any public perception that we are heading towards an animal rights organisation rather than where we are, uh, because that is absolutely, definitely not the case. We are a very pragmatic, very realistic organisation. We work very constructively and proactively with lots of industries involved in the animal welfare world. So if you looked at, for instance, uh, the situation with horse racing as a good example, the animal rights end would say ban horse racing, it shouldn't happen at all. Where we stand is to say we understand that people are going to use horses competitively in lots of different ways. Our job is to work with the people who do it to help them understand the needs of those animals in that, in that kind of activity and to also understand the risks. Companion animals now as a, as a definition is accepted, it's well over a thousand species but obviously the most familiar are dog, cat, rabbit, horse, the small mammals and so on. So by exotics if you mean the snakes, the other reptiles, amphibians and so on, there is no reason why human beings cannot look after those animals incredibly well, but they are enormously complex animals to look after and they have very specific and special needs. Our concern at the RSPCA is people who take those kind of animals on for reasons that they may think either uh, it would be cool to have this kind of animal or it's a little bit different so wouldn't that be great when our friends come round or take them on because they're genuinely interested in the biology of these animals for instance but actually do not consider what it really means to look after them well and the commitment and the, often the expense that that requires and again our job is to make sure that, that any animals that are taken on of any species are only taken on by people who truly understand what the commitment is and actually meet the needs of the animals in their care. If they do that, in principle, and the animal's needs are, are well looked after, I don't think the RSPCA has got any issue with that at all, because the bottom line is, a rabbit is a phenomenally complex animal to look after. There is a perception that rabbits somehow are great first pets for children. Where did that come from? You know, I look at a rabbit and I see a prey animal that actually doesn't make a lot of noise when it's frightened. So actually if you don't look after it well, what you have is an animal that doesn't tell you very much about how it feels because actually its default position is to do nothing. So you can look at it and say, well he must be alright because he doesn't, he doesn't bark, he doesn't make much noise, uh, he's not frantically scratching at the bars to get out, so he must be fine. Nothing could be further from the truth. 
I have to say I was delighted when I, when I heard that the BBC were making this programme because it was clearly obvious even before we saw it that it was going to raise the profile of this issue and make people really think. The RSPCA has been the only stakeholder in this that has, had, uh, has stood up uh, and publicly said yes we should and could have done more for pedigree dogs. Absolutely we could have done, but so could the veterinary profession, so could the kennel club, so could all the other stakeholders in this. Our view now is there's been enough discussion about the causes of these problems. We have to focus our efforts collectively on solutions for the future and just leave the baggage at the door and move forwards. There are clearly serious problems in the pedigree dog world uh, and it's been disappointing, I have to say, uh, particularly in the immediate aftermath of the documentary, of the kind of level of um, uh, reaction from major stakeholders, which was, this isn't really a problem. This is, this is completely sensational. We've been sorted, this is all sorted. Don't worry about it. It's, it's, you know, it's just not an issue. It clearly isn't the case. There is compelling evidence, scientific and otherwise, that the welfare of very significant numbers of dogs is seriously compromised as a result of the way they are bred. I think the Kennel Club need to be offered the opportunity to sit round the table with the other stakeholders and it is for them to choose whether they're going to take part or they're not going to take part. But I don't think it's for the other stakeholders to necessarily say we're all going to tread on eggshells here to make sure that we don't talk about anything that might upset the Kennel Club. If there is a genuinely believed risk by all the stakeholders that activities that the Kennel Club may in some way or other, directly or indirectly, control are serious risk factors in terms of dog welfare. The RSPCA is absolutely fundamentally opposed to any kind of beauty pageant that, are, that celebrates deformity as something desirable or that promotes or allows breeding practices that put the welfare of dogs at risk. There are a number of big issues in the companion animal world that we're looking at and exploring because we have to prioritise how we spend the public's money and we want to be as effective as possible in helping the, the greatest number of animals in need. Obesity in companion animals is a major, major concern for the RSPCA. Uh, it's not just fat dogs, it's not just fat cats, it involves horses, rabbits, exotic species right across the companion animal world. Uh, and it's an epidemic that has grown over the last 20 years and despite millions of pounds being spent by pet food manufacturers and ultimately owners buying their, those foods, uh, huge numbers of PR campaigns, acres of, of press coverage uh, and television and radio coverage on it, the bottom line is we haven't even made a dent in it, um, and if, if anything, things are getting significantly worse. The stats, when you look at the number of overweight and obese dogs in the UK, and you compare it to the number of overweight and obese 11-year-olds uh, in terms of children, actually there's a, there's a lot of similarities. And actually that makes quite a lot of sense, because in terms of a family environment, dogs are generally part of the family. Uh, and they are also generally part of the family that doesn't feed itself, it is fed by a more grown-up part of the family, so by mum or by dad. Now, on that basis, actually the psychology of feeding in terms of how parents feed their children and parents feed their dogs, there may be a lot of similarities and overlap. Now, if we can help families, human and animal, together, seems to make an incredibly compelling argument uh, and that's work that we're, we're currently engaged in now and I'm in anticipating that the RSPCA's involvement in trying to deal with pet obesity is going to grow exponentially over the next couple of years.